travel back in time to 1999, when computers were very new, very large, and most importantly, very expensive. One radical thinker had a big idea. What if we took computers and put them in a hole in the wall in the slums of India and gave children access to them? Dr. Sugata Mitra was one of the first educators to ask, what might the impact of the internet be on education, and teaching, and learning? Well, he's back with us today to talk about a new chapter in education, ChatGPT. Without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with the amazing Dr. Sugata Mitra. Can you give us a little bit of context of hole in the wall experiment for people who maybe haven't heard yeah. of it? Yeah, I know. And the number of such people is actually increasing because this experiment is now 24 years uh, old, <laughs> amazingly. Anyway, the experiment was conducted in 1999. So uh, to understand it, you need to understand the context of 1999, which is personal computers had just about come into the market. The internet was there. But it was too expensive to, to own a computer and to have the internet on it. So people would, you know, use it in their offices, except if they were rich enough to, uh, to afford one. By rich enough, how much do I mean? Uh, something of the order of about two or three thousand US dollars for a desktop computer at home. Now, uh, back in 1999, that would be like a month's salary. So, you know, people just couldn't. So one of the consequences is that computers became things that professionals use. Nobody ever thought of children because, you know, how would a child get to a computer? You might as well say, should children learn how to fly a helicopter? Well, they don't have <laughs> access to helicopters, so uh, it's out. So the experiment I did in 1999 was to see what would happen if I took a computer, put it in the street, I stuck it into a wall, actually, like a bank uh, ATM, uh, at child height, and uh, just left it there, running Microsoft Windows and a browser with internet on it. And what happened was, well, history now, but you had groups of children immediately gather around it. And as all of you would probably guess, even without doing the experiment, within a few minutes and definitely within a few hours, they started to browse and they started to figure out all sorts of things. And people said, who is teaching them? I said, nobody. And they said, that's absurd. I mean, they can't learn something as complicated as a computer back in 1999 <laughs> uh, just by themselves. I mean, they're, they're street children in India, slum children. They don't have an education. They don't know English. So how are they doing all this? I didn't have an answer and it took me many years to figure that answer out. And the answer was that it wasn't, the question was not who is teaching them. The question should have been what is teaching them. Hmm. It, it wasn't human. So one thing that I love about your work, Dr. Mitra, is that you are an advocate that students should be allowed to use computers on tests because we can use them in the real life. So. I'm curious to hear more from you. How or does ChatGPT change your thinking on this? ChatGPT is doing to language what calculators did to arithmetic. Okay, I mean, I when I was a child, I had been taught how to work out the square root of a number by hand on pencil and paper. I have forgotten it completely because... I don't need to do that anymore. E even if I do need to figure out the square root of a number, I can use a calculator. We've gotten right. used to the idea. At that time, and I have a clipping from that time actually, of teachers demonstrating in the streets saying, stop the use of calculators in the classroom. Okay. Uh, so this whole thing about chat GPT and the internet uh, reminds me of that. I mean, so what, what does ChatGPT do? It can write for you. It can answer questions for you. That's pretty good. I mean, what's wrong with that? Okay. Uh, the only thing that could go wrong with it is if the answer that it gives you is not right. Okay. Mm. But then that fear is there uh, anyway in education. What if what you read in the book is not right? What if what the teacher says is not right? So chat GPT just adds one more dimension to this whole thing. Now, when it comes to examinations, what is it that we are looking for? We're looking for comprehension. 
we are not looking for memory anymore. There was a time when we were looking for memory, okay, because there were no storage devices. But now we don't need to look for memory. We, you know, memory is in our pockets, you know, gigabytes, terabytes, whatever. It doesn't matter. But do you understand is what matters. So our questions need to change to uh, do you understand? So, for example, instead of saying solve the following equation, you might change that question to what would you do to solve the following equation? Mm. There's a subtle difference. Okay, So we need to, to question those things to say what are the things that our children really need to be able to do by themselves without assistance? Well, they should be able if to anything. walk, they should be able to talk, they should be able to eat. That's about it. But is there anything else? Is there, you know, I mean, is, is, uh, what is the capital of Moldova? Is, is that a question that a child should be able to answer from their memory? What for? So, uh, so we need to change our approach, but it's easy for me to say, but as long as the exams don't change, uh, what can the school principal or the school teacher do? They have to teach right. to the exam. And the exam is from the last century. The exam is a test for memory. The exam is for stuff which we don't need anymore. So this is the this is the kind of problem that we have in education, and we uh, we really need to address this issue of uh, in an exam. What should you ask, and who is going to evaluate that answer? Now these are not these are not easy questions. You know, so so if if I was to object to my own statement, I would say, well, it's all very fine for you to say this, but who is going to make this change? Are you going to make this change? What's going to be the new exam like? Well, I have only one suggestion. At the top of our education system, at the very top, is a degree called the PhD. We are all very respectful of the PhD, Doctor of Philosophy. What is a PhD? You're given a question to which no one knows the answer. So your teacher is of not much use. You're given a couple of years to solve this, to find possible answer to the question and to write a thesis. There is no exam at the end. You just sit across the table from some experts and they just talk to you. And at the end of that conversation, maybe about 30, 40 minutes of conversation, they give you the highest degree that we have, the doctor of philosophy, that's all. So why can't we do that with a nine-year-old? Why can't we just sit across the table from a nine-year-old, ask her a few little things about, what do you like about math? Do you like math? Do you not like math? But what's the best thing you like about math? Talk to her for about 10 minutes and give her a score. Do we really need to ask her the times tables? Hmm. So, so maybe there is a way, but then it's an expensive method. You can't have everybody being interviewed in order to get a pocket. How do we do that? We, we need to solve all of these problems. Maybe we'll use chat GPT to do the interviewing. <laughs> that might work better. I don't know. But we need to think along those lines. So what I'm hearing is kind of two part there. So the first part is really challenging ourselves to ask, what is worth knowing, understanding, and being able to do in a future-facing society? And the question, second question that we might ask ourselves is, how do we humanize the assessment process? How do we do something that only we can do that computers can't? Is that kind of your thought on, on how we progress forward? So the examination or the assessment has to focus on comprehension mm. as opposed to recollection. Right. You know? uh, and and that, that is uh, sort of in a nutshell where we should be headed. Welcome to the School Leaders Project, a podcast series dedicated to helping school leaders make positive changes in their schools and communities. The School Leaders Project is brought to you by Toddle, your all-in-one teaching and learning platform made for teachers and by teachers. We started as a passion project in a school that thought that teaching tech should be as innovative as teaching teams. And we're now loved by more than 1,500 progressive K-12 schools all around the world. Um, and I'm wondering, so our audience is mostly school leaders. So what can school leaders do, do you, th do you think, to kind of best support this kind of learning, this kind of assessment, this kind of teaching? Well, you know, it, it's fairly simple. In self-organized learning environments, which is what I've been doing for the last, you know, 20 or something years, the whole idea is 
to ask the learners a question. And to start with, it might be a question to which you, the teacher, knows the answer. But it's actually even more fun if you ask the question to which even you don't know the answer. If the teacher asks a question to which she does not know the answer, she didn't know the answer. He told her. Found out. Yeah. 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 They'll remember that answer all their lives. As opposed to if you ask them a question and they say, do you know the answer? And you say, yes, I know the answer, but I'm not going to tell you. That's not any fun. Mm. But that's what the whole education system is all about. The moment the teacher comes into the classroom, you know that he knows the answers. You don't because you're stupid and mm. he is going to tell you. Well, we don't need that world. We need the world where we are good enough to figure the stuff out by ourselves. And we have the means. We have the internet, we have the devices, we have chat GPT, we have all sorts of things. This is the change that I think we need to have. You know, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. and I believe that uh, the beginnings of that are actually there inside Silicon Valley. Because Silicon Valley... The real legends of Silicon Valley, the guys who became the richest, the most powerful, and the most creative, they were driven only by curiosity. If you look at the Steve Jobs, or the Wozniaks, or Sergey Brin, or, or, or whatever, they didn't get there with anything other than being curious. How quickly can I get the answer to a question out of the mm. internet? What's the kind of device that everyone will want to buy? If those became the, ro the role models, for the next generation of adolescents, then we will have made it. The question is, will it happen? I think it will happen, but how long will it take? And will the school system actually support uh, that kind of curiosity is what will determine whether it works or not. Well, I think some are. There are lots of models, those progressive models, that are giving students the space to deeply explore concepts and deeply explore the why behind their learning. And it'll be really fun to see what those kids do in the future. Yeah, of course. They're, they're in a very different kind of world. I mean, which brings us to this whole idea of what should school prepare them for. Uh, it's become so difficult because, you know, up until the middle of the 20th century, it was fairly easy. You, you, there are defined jobs and your mm. students have to fall into one or the other of these slots. So you prepare them for all of that. Now we don't know what we have to prepare them for because we don't know what jobs will exist. Okay. And so then what should we do? Well, according to me, what we need to prepare them for is the ability to find out things for themselves. When there are questions to which we as adults can no longer provide the answers, all we can give to our children is the ability to figure it out by themselves. So, you know, these schools that have this motto on their gates, some long Latin words or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. I, I would suggest to them that they change that thing to figure it out. I love that. <laughs> so, you referenced, you're writing an article now, and I had such a delight getting ready for this podcast, just going through and reading a lot of your articles from the past couple of years. Uh, and one that really stood out to me was one that came out in 2022. And you talk about how the internet should be a subject that we teach, like math or language or social studies. Can you talk to us a little bit about that concept? Everybody should know how the internet works. What are its flaws? What are its faults? Why it could go wrong, etc., etc. So then this idea came to my mind that is it so hard to teach people how the internet works? It's been around for quite some time, you know, what, 20, 30 years now. So why not teach it like a subject, like you teach physics or chemistry and biology. Why do we teach those subjects? Because they're so important to life. Why do we teach English and poetry and literature? Because they're so important to life. So is the internet not important to life? Now the answer to that is, of course it is. It is possibly right. the most important thing in life right now. We spend most of our lives on it. So why don't we know anything about it? So I made a little curriculum. And I discovered something very interesting, and this is really important for teachers to, to think about. Why isn't the internet taught in schools? Because, first of all, there is no textbook about it. Why is there no textbook? 
because a textbook written about the internet would become obsolete the moment it's published. Mm. So you cannot have a current textbook. There is no teacher who can teach the internet because the few people who can teach people how the internet works would be working in a good lush job in Silicon Valley somewhere. Why would they be a school teacher? So you're not going to get teachers to teach about the internet. So then, if it is important to learn about the internet, and if there is no traditional way to teach about the internet, then there's only one thing we can do. We can ask the learners to learn it by themselves. Hmm. Only the internet can teach children about the internet. So that was the where I came from in that article. So cool. I'm wondering, so I'm an IB teacher, so I always come back to concepts. So I'm wondering, are there any kind of key concepts about the internet that, that a teacher could explore? Like if, if I wanted to learn more about it, what are those underlying concepts that you think are really important to understand? Like the mind. It's, this, it's like asking, where is the mind? <laughs> it's all over the place. Where's the brain in here? But where's the mind? We don't know. Where's the computer? In there. But where's the internet? All over the place. So if we start a discussion about networks like that, if you use self-organized learning, then they start to figure out the nature of the internet. And it's really, really alien because yeah. it's so new. Because how does chat GPT work? Everybody should know that, but right. nobody does. Nobody does. Everybody keeps talking about what it can do or what it has done. Oh, chat GPT said this and chat GPT said that. But how does chat GPT work? Mm. What's inside it? Why don't we know it? Because there's no one to teach it and there are no textbooks. Is it impossible to learn it? Well, let me tell you this. If you've done your basic high school studies and if you have four hours on the internet alone by yourself or with a couple of friends, you can figure out exactly how ChatGPT works. And it's mm -hmm. an amazing understanding. And then you would realize that what ChatGPT is doing to spelling grammar and linguistics is the same as what calculators did to adding, subtracting, multiplying and dividing. It's making spelling and grammar obsolete. Which is just wild. It isn't it. <laughs>